So, um, well, this is a little bit of different perspective, even though I think it's somehow complementary because, um, well, we will talk about the group of um, forced uh, forced displaced people, which have not been uh, mentioned at the, or not in the focus of the previous talk, especially uh, internally displaced people. So um, it's um, there is a certain focus on, let's say, technology. Um, so as I said before, I'm an Earth Observation Geoinformatics Specialist, and uh, this work is, of course, not exclusively mine. I'm just heading uh, one of these um, laboratories that we have here. But of course, there is a larger group of people involved. We're about 10 people, and we are in close collaboration with Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, Doctors Without Borders. So I think you have heard about this organization, one of the biggest um, human independent uh, humanitarian aid organization in the world. And um, so what is this Christian Doppler Laboratory? This is a very unique funding scheme that we have here in uh, Austria. It's a sort of um, in-between fundamental and applied research. Um, and it's usually in collaboration with uh, industry, so public par public private partnership. In our case, industry is um, an NGO, which I think we can be very proud of. Um, because the NGO, MSF in this case, they're actually co-funding this laboratory. And uh, what we're doing there, um, you will see that, of course, in the minute, but we are especially using latest technology like satellite remote sensing, geospatial information to support their logistics. Um, because so far, I mean, because before we started this collaboration uh, around 10 years ago, um, the humanitarian aid organizations mainly relied on um, on rumors, on on classical um, um, communication that okay, someone told this or that, so intelligence, classical intelligence, but not so much this kind of objective uh, information when that was about to plan their logistics. And of course, nowadays this is um, slightly different, I would say. Okay, zooming out a little bit. Um, Geo-humanitarian geo action, as we call it. So this is a sort of this merger of geospatial technology and humanitarian action um, has, of course, a lot of activities, poss possible uh, potential activities in the so-called disaster cycle. Um, we are focusing today on the um, on the response side, but obviously, I mean, this is uh, also a little bit of classical and um, conventional already. Um, concept because, uh, of course, also from the uh, humanitarian organization side, um, the actors would be like more involved in the in understanding the processes, uh, the root causes of conflicts in order to be better prepared. So um, there is a certain paradigm shift also in, in the humanitarian world from um, response to action. Um, informed actions, and this, of course, um, somehow relates uh, with the entire discussion on peace building, on conflict prevention, and so on and so forth. Um, we obviously have collaborations with um, many, so potentially with many uh, NGOs and organizations worldwide. Here's just a few of them um, where we had, um, and this is not the big ones, of course, we have, of course, also collaboration with, with UN organizations. Um, uh, then aid organizations from the European Commission, from um, United States and, and other big players, but these are just um, the smaller ones besides maybe ICRC and, uh, and the Red Cross, um, that uh, where we have specific collaborations in these sort of phases of the disaster cycle. So from the response um, to the more um, well, reconstruction rehabilitation phase and then preparedness and mitigation. And of course, we know that this is not a circle, but it's actually a spiral, because usually um, this is at least the um, hope that, of course, society is, is, is developing further. And um, it's not always like being after the disaster, it's, it's before the disaster. So you're in generally more and better prepared. Um, if we look at the dimension of humanitarian crisis, which lead to forced migrations, and of course, there's these three um, large pillars nowadays, conflicts, pandemics, and disasters, or natural disasters, as sometimes we call it. Um, but of course, what is a natural disaster? I mean, of course, it's, it's, it's a physical disaster that strikes. Um, and then the problem is, of course, due to the exposure of people um, to this magnitude, to a certain magnitude of a natural event. Um, that that turns this into a disaster. And for conflicts, I think I don't have to say too much, and pandemics is, is, is very prominent in our minds nowadays. 
So, um, and usually, of course, as you know, probably better than me, um, things are reinforcing itself. We are looking from a geospatial point of view, we are looking into indicators that may lead to conflict, um, but of course, also in the aftermath of disasters and conflicts, how we can um, support aid organizations, as I said before, um, and to minimize the impact so um, as far as we can um, through geospatial intelligence. As I said before, we are looking now a um, in, into a specific, let's say, subset of the um, forced um, displaced uh, population worldwide, in particular at the, which is also the largest shares, the so-called IDP, internal displaced um, people, which have not um, registered under UNHCR mandate. Why not? Because they are internally displaced, meaning they are not crossing national borders. So they are not recognized and often they are not really, um, it, there, there, is, um, there is no clear, um, let's say registration or record about their presence and where they're actually moving. Now in a high dynamic situation of a disaster, um, it is often not clear where these people are moving and where they're actually settled. Um, and therefore, um, humanitarian actors, in, in particular first responders uh, such as Médecins Sans Frontières, they need to know where these people are. Um, as we will see later on, that sounds a little bit like, um, um, yeah, uh, straightforward um, or naive even, yeah? because of course, if you act as a first responder, you are in, uh, at, at the place where things happened. Um, and you're, of course, also confronted with the people which are displaced or you're in a refugee camp or um, in, a, in, in any other temporary settlement. Um, but um, it, it, it is not easy to, to really over, overlook the situation um, on the ground um, and uh, to have, let's say, the, the required overview to direct the logistics in a proper way. Um, to illustrate that, um, this is a study we did um, not for Médecins Sans Frontières, but it was at that time um, for, um, uh, for a European um, um, institution. And in that case, the idea was actually, uh, we did this study in 2008, and the question was how an IDP camp in Darfur and Sudan has evolved over time. And there was, um, of course, there were, because they wanted to understand actually the process a little better. Um, and um, there was some reports and there were actually some figures when this whole thing started, but there was no objective means to verify that. Um, and that was for us, uh, for me also, of course, one of the eye-opening um, situations where we could really prove that satellite information provides that that uh, object, objective means for verification, because actually you cannot just represent the situation as it is, but you can actually also look back in time yeah, to see the evolution of something. So in 2008, we did this analysis, looking back into 2002, where you still see these uh, villages, um, then there is not much going on in the sense of it's just any village somewhere, you know, Zam Zam in, in the Darfur region, um, but out of a sudden, there was this influx uh, of uh, population um, when this conflict, um, oh, not when the conflict starts, but actually when um, there was some decision from, from, from some, um, on some political level um, that people should settle there. And you see, of course, here the ground <clears throat> reference here from, from MSF, and we did this um, study then in parallel. So this is the situation 2008, and it continued 2010, um, and now in 2000, uh, 2030, it looks like that. It was a bit um, sort of stabilized because they built, tried to, or built, they built also a wall around it. Um, so to, to, to somehow stop that process. And nowadays we have uh, like the situation still like it is. I mean, here we talk about more than 100,000 people, um, 130,000 people or so, like a metropolitan, like, like a, a big city actually um, that has evolved around these villages. With, with, of course, all kinds of secondary, con, um, secondary um, effects in terms of security, um, in terms of the carry, carrying capacity of the space there, uh, in terms of resources and so on and so forth. So it's all about how many people and where. So this is the key question that we have in the, um, 
humanitarian action world. And as I said, we try to combine geo spatial technologies with humanitarian action. And there is a lot of challenges involved in that. Um, allow me to go also a little bit into technical terms. Um, this is the sort of, um, yeah, well, the weight is on that, maybe. So first of all, it's about understanding the needs, the information needs. So what are actually the um, particular bits of information which are relevant for the work of humanitarian actors. And that took us um, like in the early phase of our collaboration with MSF um, at least three years to understand. I mean, it was not just that we didn't talk, um, but you know, that tuning between what technologic te technology can provide and what is actually useful took at least three years um, until we could properly design um, these kind of um, algorithms and, 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 and all the routines that we are providing here um, in order to extract this meaningful information from images in particular. So um, we are doing here these kind of um, matching activities uh, all the time. So this is, of course, also um, one of the major endeavors in our lab um, in order to, to, to improve the um, products, as we call it, information products. So, so the, the, the outcomes um, of our analysis, which should, again, uh, as I said, serve for the application domain. Um, maybe it's also interesting to mention that man, this is, of course, heavily R&D uh, focused, but there is an operational outcome. So whatever we are producing is taken over by a company, which is a spin-off company of our department, um, and they are offering this operational to MSF. So they're doing this uh, every day, every week, um, permanently and continuously. Um, so it goes directly like a pipeline um, into, into the logistics support. Um, and here's just a map where MSF is active. Of course, it's a um, uh, majority of the, of the world's countries are um, yeah, somehow affected by all kinds of conflicts, disasters, and so on. And this is, of course, a dynamic map. As you can um, imagine, here's just a few examples. Um, i show you a little bit more later on, but these are official slides from um, from MSF, where they uh, highlight this potential of this technology um, and also, of course, the um, different types of, of mapping products that, again, we look um, a little bit more into detail later on. Um, so it's mainly about, as I said, population estimation in certain areas. Um, and at the same time, more and more interest in terms of preparedness, you know, the flooding, um, or natural disasters, then um, everything with relation to, to um, yeah, vector borne diseases, for example. So, what type of um, uh, malaria intensity um, attacks they are they are actually expecting? Maybe related again to floodings, to the regime or drought regime. So, everything, of course, relates to each other, as we know. Um, and this is what we nicely can analysis uh, analyze here. Um, then, of course, we have to match um, the, the specific technology that we're using, in this case, sensors, uh, satellite sensors, um, with the scale of, of, of observation. So what is actually um, being needed in terms of detail, um, simply speaking. Um, so here, for example, this is the growth of a refugee camp um, everybody has heard of. So this is Kutupalong in Bangladesh hosting the Myanmar refugees. Um, and that grew, of course, significantly over the last, um, since the influx in 2017. Um, and, um, but it has been there before. So it used to be like a refugee camp for the last 30 years. Um, and then it significantly grew. So for that, of course, you don't need all the single details um, in terms of single structures and so on, but you see, but you look more into the extension, expansion of the footprint. And there you um, can actually look um, like with a medium resolution, but high frequent um, observation. Radar data is a big topic in particular uh, when it is about uh, cloudy situations. Um, so in um, many parts in the world, uh, of course, we don't have, uh, we have cloudy situations and uh, they are 
they can then be compensated at least in parts with radar imagery. So you can actually look through the clouds and you can also do um, um, uh, analysis independent of weather conditions and of course, independent of daylight. So this is also something that we use nowadays for settlement detection and, and flood detection. Um, in terms of detail, so this is the maximum we can see sort of at, at the moment. So it's about, um, it looks really like an, um, an air photo um, in terms of detail. So we need all, we see all the specific structures and um, all the indications for human presence um, that you can imagine. Um, but of course, we don't see individual people. Um, this is not yet the case, I would say. Um, so the maximum resolution at the moment is about 30 centimeters, 30 by 30 centimeters. Um, so you see all the individual dwellings, you see the buildings, the tents, um, but also, of course, some relevant other structures like fences and everything that, that, that adds to the whole picture. And that is then, um, in the end, uh, analyzed. So what we're aiming at, uh, as I show you later on, is to provide a population figure um, in at this uh, particular situation. So we have, of course, more consolidated um, camps or camp situations, as you see them here. This is a camp in Kenya um, hosting um, uh, refugees from Somalia already in the third generation. So of course, there is some semi-permanent structures. But of course, there are other structures which are quite dynamic and, and young and fresh and, of course, not existing in any, even not in Google Maps. Um, this is also an interesting case where we looked into, we analyzed the, 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 the reconstruction of a camp or the, the re, resettlement also of people. So that used to be a camp. And um, again, there could be like the time series um, that showed the evolution of the camp. And this is where nature now um, yeah, takes back the, the space and it's no longer needed. So some of the success stories, so to speak. Um, th this is the maximum detail that we are dealing at. So this is a UAV image, a drone image. Um, but of course, you don't need them that, that, that high detail all the time. Um, it Again, it depends on what you uh, look at. Timeliness actuality, as I said before, um, do not rely on, on Google Earth, or Google Maps, uh, at least not always. I mean, because of course, this is always lacking behind. And in conflict situations, you have changes which are happening rapidly. So on the left-hand side, you see the, the area in, in Bangladesh that was uh, affected by this expansion of the camp in Google. Um, and on the right-hand side, this is a drone image. So it's, um, well, it just shows that um, things are um, happening more rapidly as um, it can be captured by, by standard procedures. Um, on the right hand side, you see an overall like um, this is how it looks like in terms of uh, when we did this analysis. So this is an, a drone image again of this Kutapalong camp uh, where you see a very detailed structure of um, extracted dwellings. So in the end, we have like a, um, a hierarchy of different um, information layers. So you can uh, look into the very specific location of, of specific dwellings at a certain point in time. But of course, you can also um, generalize these and um, have more, more uh, aggregated results. That depends, of course, again, on the use case. So in the end, we have what we call a convergence of, of evidence. Um, so we use uh, all types of input data, um, more or less at the same time, or um, of course, depending on the, um, on the very need um, in terms of um, management or in terms of intervention. Even of course, the evidence on the ground is eventually important um, in order to validate the products. And on the right hand side, what you see is uh, when we, uh, when in this influx of, of refugees in Myanmar, from Myanmar in 2017, um, there was for a longer time due to the specific monsoon conditions, it was not possible to acquire normal, let's say optical uh, satellite images. So we had to work with radar images. And this was the first time ever um, that radar images of this detail has been used um, in this context worldwide. Um, so this was also like a, a, a real benchmark case 
um, where for the first time humanitarian organizations were relying on this kind of uh, high resolution radar data, which nowadays, of course, I mean, there is a, a, a very, very dynamic um, development of technology. Uh, this is nowadays more or less standard. So everything is being used um, that is available. Of course, there are also costs involved. I mean, this is not everything is for free. Some of these images are for free, others not. Um, but there are established agreements nowadays between satellite providers and NGOs. So that's a big business also. Um, but I think, uh, well, it makes sense at least. Yeah, um, then we look a little bit into what actually is being observed. One, as I said, is, uh, is the population as such. So you see here different um, maps, map products according to um, certain requirements. So for example, here on this image, you see an area in Port-au-Prince, you know, the, um, in Haiti, which has been heavily affected by several earthquakes starting in 2010 and then um, recursive ones. So this is for um, well, planning purposes again, planning, mission planning, logistics planning. In this case, it was about a vaccination campaign um, where MSF wanted to know where actually the people are um, because there are no census data in any, or anything else. So they have to also understand um, the overall amount of people and the different densities of um, population where they're actually expecting more people. Um, in this case, it was even enriched with some intelligent in terms of age structure. Um, so um, um, that was also that also served for specific um, vaccination treatment um, depending on the age structure or the, uh, the expected age structure. Any like always, this is a statistical sort of statistical approach, but of course highly disaggregated and and highly reliable. Um, it's not about the very specific. Um, individual case, but at the same time, of course, it's not super aggregated. Um, and it's, of course, very timeless, very, very actual. Um, so it's just the right, and this is, uh, I think, what I want to emphasize, um, that, that it should be exactly the same scale. It should, there should be a high match between the observation um, scale and the needs of the um, of the humanitarian organizations. So eventually it might be uh, fine if you have like, for example, like population density only, like in this pattern that you can see here. And this is also interesting because usually we do change analysis. Um, how camps evolve over time? Is there an increase in density or is there a decrease in density? Is there a loss, in, as a natural loss of population because they have been um, repatriated, for example, or is there an influx over the last uh, couple of years? Um, is there maybe some indication for um, additional conflicts that arise through higher densities in the camp and so on and so forth? Resource management is also a big issue, uh, fresh water. Um, firewood and so on and so forth. So everything uh, can be somehow traced to the to this analysis and um, well, something that uh, one may not really readily think of is um, by the issue of excess mortality. Um, so in this case, it was in the COVID period where we looked into the um, dynamics of yeah, mortality, or the, in this case, indication was the growth of cemeteries, um, the numbers of graves, which then were mapped against the average um, mortality or the expected mortality and whether there was um, outliers. Um, so this, again, was, an, um, I think, a very interesting or, or yeah, useful case to, to demonstrate the, the potential of of Earth observation technology, because again, it's um, well, it's something which is an, an objective uh, information source, of course, and at the same time, it is um, available wherever you need it, also in the scale uh, and in the extent um, where you need it. Okay, um, looking at the time, I think I have another couple of minutes. Maybe I share with you. Um, some insights a little bit on the technical level, um, but not too technical, I promise. Um, maybe you, you wonder how we actually do doing this. 
Um, so, of course, there is different ways how you can try to extract this information. Of course, we want to do it most uh, in, in, in the most automatic way and also objective and reliable way. Um, of course, it's not completely taken over by the machine. There is always some human interaction um, in the end uh, required. But to a large share, if you look at this here, um, the, the, the bulk word, world, sorry, sorry, the bulk work is actually done by the machine. Um, so we try to, to really identify all the relevant structures which are needed for the specific information product. So it's mainly this differentiation between different building types. Um, um, I'm skipping this. So this is a zoom in. Um, this is actually how the situation looks like. This is a camp in Minavao in, um, in Cameroon. Um, and not always the structure is as clear as this, but it, it's, it's good for illustration purposes. So, of course, everybody of us, uh, once we are trained a little bit, we would be able to delineate these single um, uh, bright dwellings that we see here in different sizes. Yeah? I mean, this is sort of the ideal case that you have one single, um, let's say, color about different shapes or different sizes of buildings. And then you can, of course, use this uh, automatic algorithm in order to interpret this. Uh, the real case or the standard case is much more complex than this. If you look at the camps in Syria, for example, then these buildings are very, very uh, much uh, attached to each other. Um, and this is, this is quite difficult, of course, to have an individual analysis here. Um, but as I said, for illustration purpose, I think that works fine. So um, we do some kind of automatic uh, extraction routine. So this is as you would do as a human interpreter, delineating these this little buildings. This is done automatically. Then we are applying some models. Um, and then in the end, we have a typology of buildings. So we're differentiating between different buildings, which is automatically extracted, counted, registered, um, and, um, and analyzed further. Yeah? So from this information, and here you see the matches, some of the, the, the building structures, they match with different uh, types of uh, buildings. We also have, of course, latrines and um, uh, some, some uh, traditional huts here, two cools and, and everything mixed. And we have, of course, also infrastructure and they tell the story then in the end. Yeah. Um, so depending on the type of buildings, the arrangements, also the age, although it tells something about the period when it was build up it also says something about the intervention of specific ngos uh, it says may tells many stories yeah so from an image which is well you can look it uh, we, you can look at it uh, but it, it's not an explicit information we have this sort of um, uh, explicit information in the end yeah um I think in the interest of time, I mean, there is um, a lot to say more, but maybe um, I'm finishing off with this slide here. Sorry. Where is it? Finishing off with this slide because it um, shows um, a nice contrast on a variety of products. Um, so, of course, the main idea is to translate images into concrete actions that could be like this is a um, well a shelling or a bombing of a, one of the refugee camps here where um, MSF and it was my MSF camp basically uh, could prove that this actually happened um, so this these sort of serious cases we know from from many applications um, this one is also interesting. This is um, um, so in Bangladesh, uh, the government uh, had the idea to um, move people out from these uh, huge refugee camps like Kutapalong because uh, it was too many there um, to um, a specific uh, area or territory. In this case, it was an island. Um, and they really modified that island uh, in, in terms of, okay, they built some structures uh, on there. They also tried to build a dam. Um, it's also used now. Um, and of course, the question arised, um, well, it's in the middle of the 
um, of the uh, tide um, of the of the river tide uh, in the in the Bay of Bengal, uh, whether this is actually suitable to host many many people, yeah? uh, or I think it was uh, calculated for about one hundred thousand people or so to move there. Um, and of course, I mean, we were not the only ones, but there were a lot of uh, analysis being done, uh, uh, looking at models and and and, and also, of, of course, observations, um, how these tidal um, uh, hubs um, uh, influence, of course, the um, the um, available territory on the on the island. And then I think later on that was a little bit uh, reconsidered. The structures are still there, but I think for for uh, less people as originally planned. Okay, so information to action, um, whatever we do, I think should be and is uh, definitely translated into concrete action. And um, we are happy that in this way we can support the humanitarian um, actors. And um, well, I'm open for questions. I know that many things are look a little bit and sound a little bit technocratic because of course in the end it's about people in need but that was also the main driver why we actually moved into this direction thank you